connected. Okay, I think we may have it now. Diane, let me know if you're getting sound. Hold on there. Still none, hang on. We should be. All right. <laughs> well, you just missed the singing part. I was singing, it was amazing. Uh, I sounded a lot, uh, it was my operatic voice, which I, I seldom use. What? Yes, I know. Uh, I've, been, I've been told that it's working now, so that's good. That's why I was telling you that I was, uh, what you missed was my singing. And um, I was, so any other singing from now on, that was the good singing that you missed. I'm sorry about that. Now it's the, I'm going to go downgrade it to the, you know, the normal singing and playing guitar. Uh, it's too bad that you missed the really good stuff. Um, I open with prayer, but I'm going to do that again because um, that's what we do when, um, when we're struggling through technology. So let's open again in prayer. Gracious and almighty God, I thank you for the gift of technology, for the heart rate that rises as things don't work. Uh, because it reminds us of life. It reminds us of the challenges that we face uh, when we are at peace and everything is on the level, Lord, and suddenly we realize and we in, our breath intakes um, that life is not something that we control, but it is certainly something that we can put in your hands to control. And so you are beyond our understanding and our wisdom but I ask your blessing upon us this day as a church, as a country, as a world. Lord, this virus uh, is teaching us that boundaries are really meaningless. Uh, they're human frailties, and we are seeing just how frail they are. Uh, I pray and ask for your healing spirit, Lord, to, to touch those who especially today need your touch. I pray for a spirit of peace to be upon those who are supporting those who are sick. Uh, Lord, who, whose family members or whose patients are struggling just to breathe. Father, I pray for your strength and your presence and your wisdom for those that you call into positions of leadership. Lord, that you would just soften hearts and break down barriers that everything that can be done will be done as humanly as possible. But Lord, we pray that as we look to you, we pray, Lord, for your wisdom and your solutions and your peace and presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm assuming that everyone is hearing now. Maybe that's what the, the, the sound bars going up and down on the screen mean. This is somewhat new to us. Uh, normally, I'm down at uh, the Spring Lake Presbyterian Church, and Jeff has all this stress. So Jeff... Uh, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate your role even more today. Uh, he's at the soundboard and he's making sure the cameras are right and all the rest. So uh, I'm going to struggle through this and, and uh, hopefully we won't have, I won't become a professional because uh, this will be short lived in the sense that we'll, we'll come back to some sense of normalcy at some, some point in the future. In the meantime, we are praying for you. Uh, we are praying that, um, that God will help you in your particular circumstances. We don't know what they are. And we are doing what we can to be a good neighbor and a good church. Uh, our website is www.slpc.org for Spring Lake Presbyterian Church.org. So slpc.org. And um, we... We're trying to, to help people in any way we can. We have deacons and other volunteers who are running errands for people, uh, especially those who are compromised in any way and possibly should not go out and make contact uh, with others in the public. Um, we will uh, try to get back to you if you reach out to the church and try to do whatever we can. Our, our resources are limited, but our love is not. So hear me say that. Um, one other thing, I just um, I want you to, to acknowledge that normally in church on Sunday morning, it goes something like this. Um, I said earlier, but I don't know if that was when we had audio or not. 
um, that I have been the pastor at the Spring Lake Presbyterian Church for 27 years, over 27 years, um, by a couple of weeks now. Um, that anniversary came and went, uh, but we were all kind of hunkering down. Um, and that's a long time uh, to be a pastor in any congregation, but it has been a blessing in many ways. I've, I've seen uh, and made many good friends and acquaintances. Um, I have lost friends, people I consider friends, people whom I've played cards with and we've laughed and they are much older than us, but uh, stayed up, kept us up much too late. Um, and Diane and I have cried um, as we have conducted funeral services for them. I have married uh, some of you, many of you, uh, and um, I've gotten to know you and you've gotten to know my rather uh, poor sense of humor through a rehearsal if we had one. Um, and many of you are accustomed to my preaching and, and its informality, um, and you're gonna see a little bit of that today, but it is from my heart. Uh, normally when I arrive at the church, someone has already entered before me, um, and that person is Carla Vink, and Carla uh, goes in and um, she uh, unlocks the doors and other people are coming in um, as a support team. Uh, Jeff Crone uh, works on the sound system, Carla, um, makes sure the flowers are right and the candles are out. Um, our office has been very attentive and Ruth has made sure that the envelopes are in the pew backs uh, for you. And that's another thought um, for those of you that uh, uh, have the ability uh, and uh, are, are, this is not impacting you financially. Uh, please remember that our, our gas bill keeps coming, our electric bill keeps coming. We are not the church that hammers down the financial stuff. As a matter of fact, since the beginning of my ministry. I have never had a stewardship drive. Um, we don't take pledges, um, but uh, we just faithfully um, thank you for supporting us. And, and if you're wondering how to do that now, because normally it's the cheeks in the seats and the checks in the plates that make that happen, um, please don't hesitate to uh, check out our website, slpc.org, and there's a, a donate button and, and push the donate button if you are able. The reality is uh, it doesn't matter, and we don't respond any faster regardless of, of who is calling. Um, we try to treat each of you um, as God's children. So uh, normally, as I've said, we, uh, we have people that come into the church and set everything up, whether it's the communion uh, with, with uh, Barb and, and Carla, uh, and I'm terrible with names, and I'm always worried about forgetting some. And then I walk in. And I wander around and I chat with people and sometimes I will turn my mic on and some people have said, hey, you got a live mic, Pastor. Uh, it's because I want you, now that we're live streaming, you to know that uh, you're part of our community, if you will. Um, and there have been some, I will uh, admit, that will look at their watch and say, oh my goodness, uh, it's, um, it's after the hour and you are not uh, starting the quote unquote worship service. And my message to them has been the same for some time. Yes, I have. We have started the worship service because um, in a time when, we're not, when we were not worried about socially distancing ourselves and, and bugs and viruses and, and vulnerabilities and all the rest, um, it's so important to reach out to our, our neighbors and, and, and the stranger that is seated next to you in the pew um, striking up a conversation. Now, some people want to kind of uh, cluster and, and, and be meditative, and we respect that, but there are others that are looking forward with a smile on their face and, and welcome a conversation. So we start after the hour. So right now, it's 12 minutes after 10, and it's about the time that we normally start worship. So I'm going to grab my guitar. <laughs> yeah, because I couldn't bring the organ. And we're going to sing, and because we don't have hymnals, um, you're stuck hearing my voice only, but um, we want to have a, a song or two that the words are pretty easy and meaningful. So I hope these words are meaningful to you. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, 
I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine, let it shine Let it shine One more time, same words This little light of mine I hope you're singing for your children I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine. Are you a foot tapper? This little light of mine. Or a dancer? I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Won't let Satan blow it out. Won't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Won't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine, hallelujah. Won't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Do Lord, do Lord, oh do Lord, little uppy. Do remember me, oh Lord, oh do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Hallelujah, do Lord, oh do Lord, oh do remember me. Look away beyond the blue horizon. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. I took Jesus as my Savior, you take him too. Look away beyond the blue. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, it's important now. I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. I hope you sang. I know that that everyone is well, and I live that example. We do, we use the gifts that we have. I hope that you sang. Uh, we're going to read a passage of scripture. I'm going to read it now, and I invite you, if you've uh, got your Bible close by, uh, it's from the Gospel of John, chapter 9, and it's a long reading. Uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 9, uh, it's the story that uh, is very familiar to some of you that grew up in the church, but maybe less familiar to some of you that uh, did not. Um, but uh, then I'm going to talk about it a little bit and unpack it and unpack the message that it may have for us uh, today. But we're going to open with prayer uh, before we read God's Word. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would illuminate our hearts, our minds, and our spirit as we read your Word today. Bless us, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the high tech that I am, I'm using my my uh, uh, Bible app, John chapter 9, beginning with verse 1. As he walked along, referring to Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man or his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When Jesus had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, Siloam means sent. Then the man went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, 
but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed, and I received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought the man to the Pharisees, who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask the man how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The blind man said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. And they asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man, referring to Jesus, is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? That's not going to go over well. They reviled him, saying, You are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and you are trying to teach us. And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see. And for those who do see, may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to Jesus, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Let us pray. Gracious God, open our hearts to your word. Reveal to us your truth through the frailty of our humanity. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. This is interesting because normally I walk around and I tap people on the shoulder and I tease them if their phone rings. 
uh, and I'm a little more restricted, but I hope that you're, you're hearing okay, and I hope that this message blesses you. Um, last Sunday, I preached about the Samaritan woman at the well, and I talked about the fact that, that the disciples had gone away into the city of Zachar uh, to try to purchase food and left Jesus alone, and then in the middle of the day, this is noon, the Bible specifically says it's noon, uh, in the heat of the day, this woman alone comes out and drops a, a bucket of actually a folded leather bag with a rope down to the bottom of the well, brings up water, and fills her, her water jar. And Jesus asks her for a drink, and there, it begins this dialogue uh, because there are some huge things that are happening there. Uh, number one, uh, Jewish men did not talk to women, even if they were Jewish women alone, uh, but let alone talking to a foreign Jewish woman, a Samaritan, a foreign woman, forgive me, a Samaritan, and let alone a one who had ideologically and theologically uh, logical enmity between the two people. They looked at the world differently, they worshipped differently, and they did things politically to try to hurt the other people. And so this was an amazing dialogue. And uh, what I found fascinating about it was she was open and honest about her frailty, about her sinfulness, about the fact that she'd been married five times, the man that she was with now she was not married to. Uh, and in spite of that, when she recognized before her in Jesus, a person who spoke truth and seemed to have a connection with something bigger than herself, she took advantage of that opportunity. And there is great wisdom that came from the Samaritan woman. You know, we read that passage and we often, we look at Jesus and what Jesus says, but I think it's important for us to, when we read the scriptures and we see these interactions, especially the two that I'm lifting up uh, from last week and today, uh, that we look at what the person, the subject who, whom Jesus encounters says. What did they say? And in the Samaritan woman, here's an opportunity for a person who has been outcast by society, who's been looked down on by society, who's considered beneath the average and the norm in society, to interact with Jesus and with profound wisdom. She said, you know, we look at the world differently. We worship differently. The Jews worship in Jerusalem, uh, in the temple. Uh, and our people, the Samaritans, say that worshiping on the mountain is where we're supposed to worship. And Jesus says to her, the day will come and is now here that we will neither worship in Jerusalem or on the mountain, but we will worship in spirit because God is spirit. And he wants us to worship in spirit and in truth. You know, sometimes we recognize that uh, we're worshiping, uh, we meditate, we're walking uh, along the beach, and um, or we're finding time alone, or we're, we're uh, however we're meditating, um, or praying. Uh, if, if, if we're praying, if, however we're doing, whatever we're doing, if you're doing it, if you're trying to tap into your spirit to, ne to connect with God, who we are taught is spirit, and you are doing that in truth. That is what God is looking for. That's what Jesus says to the Samaritan woman. And she's so amazed uh, at the revelation and the honesty that she goes into the city and goes to the people who have condemned her, who have told her what a bad person she was, who have looked down upon her, maybe spat upon her and ridiculed her, gossiped certainly about her. Um, there was a reason she went out alone to get water and not with the other women. Um, and she went to them and said, I met this amazing man. Could he be the Messiah? He told me everything about me. Could he be the one that we've been waiting for? Now, in our passage in chapter 9 of John, we see Jesus coming in and to a city, and he meets a blind man begging. Now, it was not uncommon if you were blind from birth, the only income source that you could make um, was to beg in all likelihood. It was, you know, if, if for, in order for you to work in the field or, or do some other industry, it was difficult. Now, that's less true today. Um, I, I have encountered people, and, and maybe you have too. I remember being in the airport one day with Diane, 
and a man came in very fast and he walked into it was a different time and and you could walk up to the gates we were seated at a gate and he handed us cards and um and he hit, put a card in my hand and moved on to the next person so fast and i i think he encountered about 20 people and i looked at the card and it said i am deaf and uh, um you know i can't make any money uh would you please give me money and i looked up and of course i'm thinking wow this is a person whose life is tougher than my own um, and I'm doing the mental calculation in my mind. How much do I have? You know, cash. We all live by plastic. Um, can I, you know, can I reach in and help him out? Before I did that, I saw a woman encounter him. I mean, rapidly. She made a beeline to him, and she literally took his coat and forced him to face her. And she started to sign. Now I cannot sign. We have people in our church that can sign. And so I don't even want to attempt to look like I'm signing because uh, they'll call me on it. But um, um, she, she was just face to face and she was signing so rapidly, so fast. And he began signing back. And it was a silent argument, a silent encounter that was really powerful to watch. And so forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm facing dealing with a cold and sniffles like, like this is why we're separate, right? Um, and he finally kind of threw back his shoulders and huffed and he stormed out. And my curiosity got the best of me. I, I, I just, I walked up to the woman and I, I said, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, may I ask you what that was about? And she turned to me and said, my brother is deaf. And he works every day. And I told this person that he did not have to get money this way because he could work. He could find a job at work. And so there are many of us. Oh, first of all, I thought that was pretty impressive. Um, and every circumstance is different. I recognize that. Um, but I, I, I always think it's amazing that there are things that we can do for others to make the world a better place. And even for people who can't physically be capable of doing some of the things that we do, um, they can find another way to help others. And, and maybe that help is simply um, making a phone call to another person and saying, hey, I've been thinking about you. I've been praying for you. I know I'm, I'm stuck here um, and I'm dealing with my own physical realities, but um, I, think, I think if we're prayerfully searching, God can find a way for us to fulfill our purpose. And interestingly enough, that's what the disciples were asking Jesus. They said, here's a person who was blind and is begging. Um, why did that happen? Um, was it because he sinned and they actually believed, uh, and many people still believe uh, that people suffer because of something wrong with them. And sometimes we think that about ourselves and our own suffering. What did I do wrong that, I, that I'm suffering? And Jesus just totally debunks that. Um, they actually said, you know, was it his sin or his parents' sin? Because they believed that sin and the obligation and the burden of sin um, and the accountability for it, the punishment for it, could pass to another generation. Now, arguably, there may be something to that. And some of you are, are thinking right now, wait a minute, uh, Reverend Dan, hold on. Now, this is what I'm, I'm saying, because uh, this is a monologue. I know you don't get a chance to speak back, but I bet there'll be notes. Um, but you know, if we as parents um, mess up, and uh, I raised three girls and, and um, I have lost my temper, I have messed up, um, I have said things that you cannot unsay, um, I have um, you know, tried to do the right thing as a parent, but sometimes um, we fall short. And I, I think number one, let's give parents a break. Let's uh, be kind and gracious to each other. Um, you know, in Disneyland, well, it was Disney World. Stay away from the teacups. I, my tummy cannot handle them. In Disney World, um, they call the employees cast members. Uh, and the reason they call them cast members is because they are expecting them to act in a certain way. And we were down, we were blessed, and this was uh, <laughs> decades ago now. Uh, we were down in Disney World, and I, I overheard an irate customer in one of the stores um, really, really getting aggressive with one of the uh, cast members, the Disney cast. 
Um, this wasn't the princess. This was one of the people that was working behind the counter, maybe at the the tiller, the till, the tiller. <laughs> um, and there was some frustration. And I could see the woman had been just buffeted for some time. And you could see her life bar, kind of like the old Mario screen, kind of going down. And I watched just at the point where I thought that the Disney cast member was going to break. Another cast member came in, took her, moved her aside with a smile on her face, took her place and said, how may I help you? I think that that's a wonderful technique for us as family uh, and as parents. Now, some of you might be thinking, hey, I don't have a partner who's there to be able to do that. Uh, well, look for resources in your life to help you as a parent. Um, we need to do that. So you can see why my sermons go for a little while because they branch out a bit. Um, but to support each other in parenting especially, but in, in every other uh, venue of life, support each other. That's, that's, I think, what God wants for us to do. So, having said that, uh, Jesus answers the disciples' questions. It's neither because of the sin of the individual or the sin of anyone else. It's because God is about to be glorified. Now, some of us might argue, I certainly thought when I read this, wow, this person suffered so that God might be glorified. Um, and there are things that are bigger than me. I will tell you that. Uh, but the world is full of suffering. There is suffering in the world. And, and, and some of it we bring upon ourselves. Some of it are imposed upon us by others. You know? um, and we are wait this, is the, this is the message of faith that we are looking for a time when that suffering is gone. And that is the promise of the gospel. And that's my faith model. Uh, and I'm gonna, I have a lot of questions I'm going to ask. Uh, if I'm able to, because there are things I certainly don't understand. But I do understand when we see uh, something, something glorious happen that we don't need to judge that in a negative way. We can celebrate that. And so uh, what happens is Jesus on the Sabbath bends down, spits, makes mud out of his saliva, and pastes it on the eyes of of the blind man. And then he tells him to go to the pool of Siloam, which the Bible tells us it translates sense and wash. And he follows Jesus's commands. And he washes and the Bible tells us he regains his sight. I can only imagine what that must have been like the first time that by the time he got that the mud got to the pool, the mud would have would have dried. It would have caked upon his eyelids, uh, and as he washed it away, to suddenly realize first he's seeing the water, the light reflected on the water. He's feeling the cool water as he always have, but he sees, and and his brain has got to be processing what is happening, and it, it must be all new to him. He was born blind. And he begins to realize that the things that he had heard and the things that he had felt, now there is a new sense given to him and he can see. And he makes his way back glorifying God. And Jesus is not there. Apparently, Jesus isn't there. But the people are there and they see him and they recognize him. And they say, hey, aren't you the one who was, was begging you were blind. What, what happened? And he, he explained the story, and some of them took them, him to the church, the religious leaders. Now, here's, here's the weird thing about church. I was on the radio um, with uh, a local DJ, Jesse Bruce, who I just have great admiration for him, what gifts and skills that man has. Um, he doesn't even realize how skilled he is, and those are the best people. But uh, he was on the other side of glass. Walt Zerlot, a member of our church and the news director at WGHN at the time, um, had his headphones on and, and uh, seated next to me, and I had my headphones on. It's a very artificial environment, um, very strange, kind of, kind of like this. Um, and he sat on the other side of the glass, and uh, Jesse, uh, it was live radio, like this is live, unless you're watching a recording of it. Um, so there was no editing allowed. And Jesse knew my background. 
he knew a bit of my background and he, and he knew that I grew up in a fairly dysfunctional uh, environment. And uh, he said, you know, Reverend Dan, I, I, I know a little bit about, I've heard a little bit about where you kind of came from and what you grew up through. Um, we all have our own challenges, right? Um, he said, and I, I, you went into the ministry and you went into law enforcement. And I'm, uh, I see a similarity in both of them in a way, and which was very unique for Jesse to see that. Uh, and he said, my guess is you were seeking, you, were, you went to the church because you were seeking sanctuary. And I laughed. Now I'm on live radio and I, I laughed out loud. Uh, and I said, Jesse, you don't go to church, do you? And he said, uh, first of all, he leaned back. And, and this was a, a long time ago, more than a decade. And uh, the, the, I saw the blood kind of um, come back to his face and... Maybe he was thinking, I don't know about politics or all the rest. We're a conservative community. But he spoke truth. He spoke truth. And he said, no, Reverend Dan, I don't. And I said, speaking truth. Jesse, some of the meanest people I've ever met, I've met in church. Maybe you've experienced that. Maybe that's why you don't go to church. Hey, um, I think the most important thing in the world is for you to find the place where God wants you to be and, 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 and worship how God wants you to worship. I am not the person to tell you that. I can tell you about my faith model, but I think that's the important thing for you. <sighs> so here's a blind man, and uh, this is 2,000 years ago, and amazingly enough, it's, it's, it's amazingly similar because there's politics involved. And Jesus had broken the rules. You see, the Jewish law of Sabbath said that you could not even knead dough to make bread on the Sabbath. So you could not make mud to heal on the Sabbath. They were focused that much. They, they literally, there were some of them there that instead of seeing the miracle of healing, they saw the broken rule, their rule, and they were offended. And they automatically labeled Jesus a sinner. And they told the man that, that he couldn't be from God, Jesus couldn't be from God because he was a sinner, because they couldn't get out of that cubicle in their mind. And here, like the Samaritan woman, the man begins to tell them, isn't this amazing? Since the beginning of time, no one has been able to give sight back to the blind. And yet this person did. He must be from God. Now, I jumped ahead a little bit because um, in order to, to prove themselves right, they, they literally said, well, maybe he's lying. Maybe, maybe this is a, a fraud that has been set up for some purpose. Um, and, and let's bring his parents in so that they can speak and testify to the fact, fact that uh, he had indeed been born blind. And the parents were not stupid. And it also gives us amazing insight into the politics involved. Because the parents said, yep, he's our son. We're not lying. We're willing to answer that. And he was born blind. We're willing to answer that. We stand by that. But as for how he was healed, ask him. He is of age. And the gospel literally tells us that the reason they said this is because they were afraid of the consequences of offending the community leaders what it would mean to them to be cast out of the synagogue, to be cast out of the center of life for the Jewish person. So they bring the band back, and now he begins to tell them, listen, are you asking me these questions repetitively because you want to become one of his followers? And you can almost see the, 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 the grinding of teeth, the, the, the jaw lines, getting the anger in another person. If you haven't seen that before, I have. I have the ability to create that in others at times. Um, I have a tendency to step into the line of fire and I don't tolerate bullies well. Um, and ah, be it what, it what it is. 
but I've seen that. And so when I read this passage, I can just see that play out in, this, in my mind. And they literally, they say, you were, we're, we're followers of Moses. We are perfect. You are, you want to be his follower? Get out. And, you know, and I'm so glad I didn't swear there. Uh, get out. And they cast him out of the life of the synagogue. Now, we're given uh, a follow-up where Jesus encounters the man who had been born blind and now sees. And he offers them this truth, uh, a deeper understanding. You see, sometimes uh, the man, he recognized that Jesus was from God. He told the, the people, the, the Pharisees, well, what do you say about him, they, they asked. And he said, he's a prophet. He acknowledged the fact that Jesus was from God. But now we have the ability to take it to another level. When Jesus gives the man who now sees the opportunity to do something with that insight and to recognize that this is the person who literally is God standing before him the Messiah that was to come. And he said, I came into the world so that the blind might see. How many of us are spiritually blind? Um, we, you know, we, we look at the churches, we look at the televangelists, we look at the, um, the, the things that we do wrong as, as human beings, and we're, we're, we're depressed, and we're angry, and we're frustrated, and we point, and correctly so, we point at them and call them hypocrites. But we don't our, allow ourselves to see God's truth within broken vessels. Because you're a broken vessel to, as well. We, if we seek to allow ourselves to, to, to gain that insight and to find God all around us, suddenly our eyes are opened. And Jesus said, I came that the blind might see. But he followed that up with, and that some who claim to see might become blind. And again, one of those mysteries. But the Pharisees, the religious leaders, I say that in the broadest sense, the religious leaders realized that he might be talking about them. And they ask him, and he says to them, if you didn't know that you were blind, you wouldn't be sinning. But because you claim to see because you you claim to have a, a deeper truth but you don't have a heart that is open to being a vessel and a vehicle for God's love your sin remains now there's mystery in that but there's also a message I think there's a message to each and every one of us to 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 reflect God's love Diane and I watched a movie because we have been sheltering in place it's called Troop Zero, and if you get a chance to watch it, I hope you do. It was set in the Deep South, and it's about a little girl whose mother has died and uh, whose dad is a bit of a failure as an attorney, as a lawyer, um, because he takes on some really um, sad cases. And the equivalent of a brownie troop, uh, it's called something else, but uh, I think they're, they're, it's a, the equivalent of a brownie troop. And... They, I don't want to give too much away, but the irony is they make it to a jamboree. They make it to the celebration. And as, they, as this troop zero, who has uh, been looked down upon, they were the misfits of the community, are giving everything they've got to put their hearts out for others. The people in the audience, the troops themselves, whose model was to be kind and gracious to others. We are kind and gracious. We're laughing and ridiculing and casting aspersions. And I told Diane, I said, you know, it reminds me of the Jesus movement in high school. Uh, people would be sitting around trees, under the shade of trees, reading the, the, the way uh, translation of the Bible. 
and they were and and they would just be some of the meanest people not all of them but some of them were the meanest people <sighs> pharisees have been around a long time in many shapes and sizes don't judge god by our brokenness i have been broken i may have offended uh, I may have offended you. Uh, I apologize to you. Uh, don't judge God by our frailty and our brokenness. And recognize that when you can see beyond and begin to see, and pray for this, begin to see God's truth, God's light, then we truly are all healed. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, I ask that you would open our eyes to see a new and deeper truth that has always existed and that always will, that you love us. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now I'm going to do the benediction that I give every Sunday at the Spring Lake Presbyterian Church. Uh, it's really a charge, but I hope you receive its words, especially today. Go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one, evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And God bless and keep you, each and every one of you. Amen.